So welcome everybody to today's Ento Live. We've got Dr. Tim King from Oxford University, and he's going to be talking to us about his fascinating work on yellow meadow ants and their importance in grasslands. So Tim, over to you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry it's taken so long to get connected properly. Here you can see a typical anthill. It's about 40 years old and it's circular, hemispherical in shape. And notice that it provides a lot of heterogeneity to the surrounding grassland. It's got north, south, east and west facing sides. And so it's not merely uh, boring grassland, if you like. Um, you can see straight away that its vegetation differs from that in the surrounding soil. You have perhaps uh, wild thyme and squinancy wort on top, and around it you've got rough hawkbit, which hardly occurs on the anthill itself. So you can see straight away it's got characteristic vegetation, although the differences are much more obvious on calcareous grassland than in acidic grassland. So it's got a different species balance. In fact, a botanist might put it in CG7, whereas the surrounding grasslands is CG2 and CG3. Now it's got bare soil on top on the left-hand side, which is suitable for the two grasshoppers, the meadow grasshopper and uh, Cortipus, Cortipus parallelus and the field grasshopper Cortipus bruneus to ovipositon and they're 15 to 30 times more likely to deposit their eggs on an anthill than, any, than anywhere else in the grassland. Now you might think these anthills are separate pimples. There's nothing further from the truth. The ants dominate the whole subterranean soil. Um, and as it are underneath the surrounding soil, there might be as many as 5,000 per square meter of yellow meadow ants, Laceus flavus. And so they dominate the soil beneath the ground in the same way as, say, sheep or cattle might dominate above the ground. And they can go up to 165 kilograms per hectare of dry mass. And that's equivalent to the sheep grazing above. So at three sheep an acre or eight a hectare, they would weigh in dry mass, say, about the same. So they're very important. So on United Nations World Soil Day, it's important to query these ants. What do you feed on? Do you have any pets? Why are annual plants much more frequent on the mounds than surrounding? What would be the effect on removing your colonies on species richness and biodiversity in the grassland? And my contention is that they greatly increase both plant and animal diversity. I'll deal with background first. Then I'll deal briefly with plant diversity and spend the rest of the time on animal, particularly invertebrate and insect biodiversity. Now it's World Soil Day, and this shows a, a diagram which gives you some inkling of the complexity of soil, which is really a black box. The horizontal line towards the top separates the soil beneath from the above ground organisms. And you can see beneath the soil, below ground, there's incredible range of different groups of organisms all interacting. And I went to a lecture the other day which suggested that there are at least 1.5 million different species of fungi in the world, for example. Uh, just, I hope you can see my cursor, just um, one of these different sorts of organisms. And this diagram goes from left to right, so it tends to put the um, photosynthesizers on the left and the higher consumers on the right hand side and you can see how complex it is and really we know very little indeed about it. 
So this is my contribution to World Soil Day. So why is this particular species special? Well, it's an allogenic engineer. I mean by this, that it's a proper engineer. And uh, that means it's equivalent to status of corals and beavers and some termites. In other words, it produces long lasting structures which are used by a wide range of other organisms. It's a keystone species in the sense that if you removed it, it the whole ecosystem would lose a range of different species which are associated with the mounds. The mounds are very long lived and I'll explain later and they contribute tremendously to grassland heterogeneity and the ants themselves affect the grassland between the anthills. Um, the extent of their effect isn't quite established yet but certainly they have a considerable effect on flora and fauna. So if we go to um, a few pictures of what they look like, these are the anthills at Bushy Park. You can see them easily on Google Earth. Typical example of large anthills. This taken by Dave Lavelle in his marvelous site at Castle Martin on the Pembrokeshire coast shows a hectare, 100 meters by 100 meters with each little dot being a separate large anthill. And one of my favorite pictures was also taken by him from Moody Nose on the Pembrokeshire coast. And you can see the extent of these mounds, which extend over several hectares, or I suspect square miles. These anthills are at Rossilli Down in the Gower. Oh, those aren't anthills in the distance, they're sand dunes. But in the immediate foreground, there's a population of anthills. And this is my site at Aston Rowett National Nature Reserve. This is probably the best photograph I've got from the Porton Ranges. Porton Ranges are the biggest anthill site in Britain, seven square miles, three million anthills. So why? aren't they everywhere? Well, they are in lots of different places. They established in a large number of grazed grasslands, salt marshes, sea cliffs, mountain grasslands, old parklands, marshes, roadside verges, churchyards. Now they're abandoned in, abundant in British grazed pastures from 1450 to 1780. And we know this from historical data. But there was a big eradication campaign in the late 1700s. There, the county agricultural reports are full of explanations for how to get rid of them because they reduce the productivity of pastures. Uh, workmen removed the mounds, they burnt them, used the soil as fertilizer, and did this on a very large scale. At that stage, uh, these agricultural reports suggest that you could walk across Rutland or Northamptonshire just by walking from the top of one anthill to another. So there was a major e eradication campaign which was carried on by ploughing pastures and Napoleonic Wars, agricultural depressions like that in the, the end of the 1800s, First and Second World Wars, and then rabbit myxomatosis dealt a blow to a lot of the um, previously raised pastures, which depended on rabbit grazing to keep the vegetation down, because when the vegetation becomes too high for too long or scrub invades, the anthills disappear. They've got considerable cultural significance. Shakespeare mentions them, for example. You remember Henry VI um, sat down on a Mole Hill, well, that was really probably an abandoned anthill, um, and uh, that was meant to be a, a, a mere um, a sort, sort of um, demeaning to him. 
compared with a throne. And then uh, William III, William of Orange, died with his horse Sorrel, fell down on molehills in Hampton Court. But really, they were probably anthills. I can't imagine that the horse would have fallen down on a molehill. So instead of toasting the little gentleman in black velvet, they really ought to have toasted the maidens in yellow coats. And the poet John Clare couldn't tell his anthills from his molehills. But nevertheless, they're more or less invisible even to many biologists. And if you haven't got anthills in your back garden, your local roadside verge, or, um, then why not? They should be there. So there are several possible reasons. One is that they're unnoticed. Um, and it's interesting that when I did these surveys in Richmond Park in 2017, 2018, a lot of the citizen scientists there hadn't realized that there were any anthills in Richmond Park at all. Whereas in those four square miles, there are about 400,000 there. So you, they're probably there somewhere or else they could be a long way away from a source of ant queens, which could have colonized your area. Perhaps the most distantly ants can invade uh, ant queens, which are quite heavy. Fertilized ant queens can invade a new site is five kilometers away. Or there could have been lack of grazing for more than seven years and the grasses and the scrub could have ousted the anthills, which require a warm temperature in them in order to maintain their ant colonies. Or perhaps mowing has been too intense, trampling by cattle. It's only very occasionally is trampling too intense to get rid of it. it happens in Richmond Park in, in a site where the deer are fed in winter, or else most likely there's been cultivation or ploughing in the last 20 years. Otherwise, they should be there. So they're worth introducing to newly established grasslands which lack them, because my contention is that they increase biodiversity. And this used to be done with a wheelbarrow, um, Lightwell Meadows, Ironbridge Bypass, 1985, and um, it's difficult to do with a wheelbarrow to move anthills from one site to another, but that was done on a quite a large scale, although these anthills collapsed. So in Richmond Park, we tried it with a low loader. And what happened is top right, we made some holes with this tree spade uh, in a site which lacked anthills. And then we had to get rid of anthills from this particular site because a stream was being widened. So top left, we picked them up with this tree spade and bottom left, we transported them a kilometer into the new site and there we put, put them in the relevant holes. And as far as I can tell, these ant five anthills have survived since. So it should be possible to transplant them elsewhere. Why do you think that's worthwhile? Well, grasslands consist of two habitats, anthills and the surrounding grasslands. Uh, this ant is the main mound builder in European grasslands. And presumably the anthills increase the rate at which the young broods develop because they keep the brood warm. In fact, the ants move their brood around in the mound to keep them at the optimal temperature. These worker ants are three to four millimeters long, yellow, subterranean. There can be up to 100,000 workers in a large mound and they carry soil particles onto the rain, especially at night after rain. So I would rate them as engineers, farmers and conservationists. But the main value in that in grasslands is that they create heterogeneity. Uh, 
difference in surface, different in aspect, and much more variety, which provides suitable habitats, microhabitats for both plants and animals. But even amongst the anthills, there's heterogeneity in size. Some are abandoned and some are still occupied most of the time and can be for tens or perhaps hundreds of years. I did a survey at Aston Rowett National Nature Reserve, for example. Um, the figures on the left are the ant hills in 2007, 250 ant hills, and I recorded them again in, I recorded them again in 2015. And in 2007, left-hand side, some were occupied and some were abandoned. The occupied ones, if they continue to be occupied, increase in volume by 30%. That happened to the abandoned ones as well. If they were occupied within those eight years, they increased in volume by 18%. But if they become abandoned, they reduce in volume. And that's because the chambers and channels inside the mound gradually collapse and reduce their volume. And in fact, so quite a lot of the surrounding grassland might be ex anthill. We don't know yet how much, but some of it might be ex anthill. So this is a complex graph, um, which I'll try to skate over. Um, the the vertical axis is the proportion of anthills in percent. And these are the same anthills which I recorded in 1970 in blue, 2007 in red, and 2015 in green. And across from left to right goes an increase in volume. So the biggest anthills are on the right hand side. This is a logarithmic scale on the lower axis. So let's just concentrate on the largest anthills, which is the three bars on the right hand side, three sets of bars. Now, to get up to 100 litres, the anthill needs to be, if you like, a metre by a metre of soil and 10 centimetres high. So that's quite a lot of soil. Rome wasn't built in a day. Now, in 1970, these anthills, only a very small proportion of them were in these bars. Only 1% was that large. But you can see that in 2007, um, about 8% were in that third bar from the end. And in 2015, it was 13%. And these were the same anthills growing and growing and growing year by year. So you've got a range of anthills of different sizes. And this shows my graph from five different sites in Britain uh, when I could actually find out when the grassland was first established. And the grassland age is on the horizontal axis. And there's a volume of the total total amount of soil which has been accumulated by the ants on the vertical axis. And you can see that they grow fairly rapidly at first, according to these data, and then their rate of growth slows up, presumably because erosion takes place, grazing by cattle, um, breaking down by rabbits, all sorts of other factors. And I'm surprised the graph turned out to be so good, considering all the different factors which can affect the rate of anthill growth. These are the data I have from the very old sites. Um, and with the anthill population volume index shown on the right hand side. And you can see that they're the largest of the lot in the oldest sites, 380 years old, 438, 529. And recently, Dave Lavelle at Castle Martin has got some excellent data from Moody Nose, Stack Rocks and so on, which are probably the biggest anthills in the country. Um, they've been perhaps 
grazed, I don't know where to put them on the horizontal axis, but I would put them at a thousand years. The only anthills I've looked at, which have been mapped a long time apart, are these from White and Woods in Oxford. In the left-hand diagram was produced by John Pontin in the 1950s, where each black dot represents an anthill on his site. The circles represent the size of the anthill, notional size of the ants territories, depending on the number of queens the colony produced. What he did was to put tiles on the top of each anthill and then count the number of queens they produced and the size of the territory, the diameter of the territory, the radius of the ter territory is uh, proportional to square root of number of queens. And you can see that he had 29 anthills on the left hand side. I went back there 62 years later and found the same site and sampled them again. And 21 out of the 29 anthills were still there and the ants were still in them and, and growing, although the mounds were perhaps a little bit larger. So it's the same site, uh, 62 years apart. So we know they're occupied for a long time. They have considerable biomass. It's the biggest biomass for an ant species worldwide. And they can haul up to seven tons per hectare of mineral soil to the surface each year. Mainly, you don't see them, they're largely subterranean. This mainly happens at night after rain. So the ants themselves, this is an ant's head. You can see it's got very small eyes. They're totally subterranean apart from a nuptial flight. Um, and so, it's not surprising they don't only need like eyes with about 60 facets on. Of course, they mainly see their way around, if you like, <laughs> with their antennae. Ants shout to one another in molecules and they produce all sorts of chemicals with their glands and sense them with their antennae. This shows the three main sorts of the ant. The workers are in the middle, that's the smallest. And then the winged drone and the winged queen at the bottom. And you can see how much bigger the queen is than the workers. In fact, the pupa of the queen isn't much bigger than the pupa of a drone, but the ants feed them up in the last two weeks before they go off in nuptial flight by feeding them whole organisms, um, such as mites, springtails, aphids, and so on uh, around the mound. And the queens put on two or three times their weight um, after they've hatched out of the pupa and before they fly off on the nuptial flight. So this, when they arrive on bare soil, either singly or in groups, they burrow into the soil and um, then break their wing muscles broken down, provide the energy for the queens to produce um, eggs and bring up the uh, feed the larvae and produce their first set of worker ants and then she's really in business because these worker ants can start foraging to some extent and also heaping up soil and starting to establish a hill. So that's a typical starting until notice that rough hawk bit has become rough hawk bit has become um, in the killed is becoming killed by the heaped soil and rosette plants tend to be can't survive soil heaping. Um, not just in the early stages, but throughout the growth of the anthill. So some of the Rosette plants hardly occur on anthills at all. Underneath the soil, the ants have produced a series of chambers and channels um, in which they ultimately read their, they, they raise their brood. The queen is somewhere there producing eggs and all the workers are, are milling around beneath the soil in the anthill. So that's a tip surface of a typical anthill. Notice the rabbit droppings concentrated on top and 
the bare soil, patches of bare soil there. On the right hand side, there's probably a bit of rock rose, Hel Helianthemum numularium, which is also very common on anthills, as is wild thyme. And so that's a typical anthill aspect. But of course, that's just a pimple on the surface and the territories, the ants own the territory completely in the grassland. So they produce sand dunes in the grassland. I, I put sand in inverted commas because of course it's really clay dunes in the grassland because the ants can only pick up soil below a certain diameter, 0.66 of a millimeter. Uh, they smother rosette species. It favors plant species capable of growing rapidly through heap soil. I think um, one of these is Galium virum, um, ladies' bed straw, creates bare soil, higher temperatures and reduced soil organic matter produce dry soil in midsummer. Um, so Acrocarpus mosses and winter annuals are confined to anthills, um, more or less. I've seen about 20 or 30 different winter annual species confined to anthills. Um, one reason is that they have seeds sensitive to the red far red ratio. So they can recognize when, when they're exposed to the atmosphere. When they're exposed to the atmosphere, they have an equal, if you like, red far red ratio. But when they're underneath other leaves, the leaves cut out the red light, uh, making the ratio for phytochrome um, much more towards far red. Why are thyme and rock rose particularly abundant on anthills? Well, if you dissect anthills, you find that many plants of thyme and rock rose are single plants, which have branch and branch and branch. So we assume that thyme was there to start with, but it's branched as the soil has been heaped over the surface. It's grown up through the soil, branching and branching and branching, so that when you think there are lots of thyme plants on an anthill, they may even be all parts of a single plant. And rosette herbs are buried and excluded as seedlings. Um, although you only see this happen if you happen to look at anthills at various times. Uh, if you observe the same anthill time and time and time again. So what do the ants feed on? Well, they largely feed on aphids, underground root aphids. There are 22 specialized species of root aphids, which are symbionts, pets, cattle, if you like, of the ants. The ants farm them. And this is a particularly efficient way of finding energy because the aphids suck the sugars and amino acids directly from the plant phloem. They, the ants tickle their behinds, take the droplets of honeydew to their larvae in the mounds. The aphids are largely beneath the surrounding grassland in groups. And so this is efficient, not just because they're getting plant sugars directly from the plant before they've had a chance to be made into leaves or stems or anything like that. But the ants themselves are about 40% efficient in the, in the conversion of incoming energy to ant material, whereas something like a sheep um, takes plant matter after it's been made into leaves, and then is only about 3% efficient in converting it into sheep biomass. So there are 22 specialized species of aphids, which are, there's a lot of evidence which comes from lab experiments as well as from odd observations in the wild, that in the autumn, the ants collect these aphids and they're placed in groups in the mounds as the ants hibernate with the ants themselves, you can find these lumps of aphids in the mounds. And then in spring, the ants take them up and 
replaced them on the roots of the plants. A high proportion of these aphids are single clones, so it's rather like human farming in the sense that they select particular strains of particular species of aphids for placing on the roots of the plants. And so they're rather selective, and that's been shown in experiments recently when people have presented the ants with several different species of aphid, and they have a strong preference for some over others. So those are the sorts of aphids I got hold of, um, a range, range of aphids um, in soil samples. And to get these soil samples, you go to, for example, a Tolgren funnel. You put the soil sample beneath a bulb that produces heat and light. The organisms less than two millimeters in diameter go through the gauze and fall into a very pleasant death in a beaker of alcohol. And then you sample them. Um, so that's what a Tolgren funnel setup looks like. And uh, that's an example of an ant clinging on to an aphid having gone through the gauze and it's impossible to detect the, uh, to separate the aphid from the ant. Now, most aphids have got cornicles. Uh, most aphids growing on shrubs and so on have got cornicles which are backward pointing and produce defensive secretions. But these particular species of ants don't have them. This is an example of a common one, Anisia furcata, and you can see two things. First of all, it's got no cornicles to speak of. It doesn't need defense against the ants. And secondly, it's got a hairy bottom. And this hairy bottom enables it to accumulate a droplet of honeydew in a suitable place for the ant workers to pick it up. Now, in the ant colony, there are usually one to two queens, 100,000 workers, up to 500 queens and 500 drones can be produced in the mating season. Um, so the, ant, the mound itself is probably on average about half a square meter across the underground territory can be five to six square meters and they probably keep 17,000 or so aphids per colony with 6% in the mound and over 90% beneath the surrounding grassland. These are springtails, which are very abundant. You can see the uh, Calembola, um, Furca at the bottom, and these are mites, incredible range of mites you get from soil samples. Fascinating, of course, they're not insects. Um, food source, so, They've got a lot of potential um, as for food, for research, because their relationships with other organisms are rather complex and aren't all that well known, really. They're a food source for the green woodpecker and grey partridge, um, although grey partridges, there aren't many of them left. Um, Overposition of grasshoppers, butterflies and moths on the bare soil on top, or bare warm soil on top. There are numerous ant-associated little organisms. I'll mention one or two of those later. The, um, and lots of invertebrates require specialised conditions, warmer conditions. We don't know whether sand wasps, interesting point, whether sand wasps use the bare soil on top or whether they're repelled in some way by the ants. And they produce early spring grazing for sheep, cattle, deer, rabbits, and so on. Lots of other organisms, lots of other organisms attack them. And so you can get anthill damage on a large scale, um, particularly through, say, uh, rabbits, sheep, cattle can produce bare soil, but this exposure of bare soil, a middle box, can be colonized by all sorts of social bees, social wasps, solitary bees and solitary wasps, and in turn, these colonies can be attacked by mice, field mice, voles, shrews, so on. 
And so there's the potential for damaged anthills to produce heterogeneity in the grassland too. This, let me mention one or two specialized parasites and so on. The, um, this shows Antenophorus, uh, a little mite which I found round the necks of a large number of ant workers. These little mites are only 100, 1 250th of an inch across. They um, are, they've got crab like forelimbs here, which go round the necks of the ants. And as the ants feed, regurgitate, um, swap food with other workers, these stick their heads up and slurp up the liquid, which is meant to be transferred between one ant and another. You may be able to see this. Um, this is, is a scanning electron micrograph of the whole thing. This is the ant's head round here with its mandibles. And but beneath the ant's head, with its long crab-like four limbs stuck round the ant and holding it on is this down the bottom uh, mite which is in a suitable position near the mouth parts just to stick its head up and slurp up the food which was intended for the ant. Here's a little white blind woodlouse which isn't just in Lacey's flavours mounds but also in the mounds, you can find it in the mounds, for example, of uh, the black ant Lacey's niger. And um, this tends to specialize on the trash jumps, perhaps, because there's some doubt about this, because it can sense the oleic acid, the olive oil, which is uh, produced by dead ants. And here are two examples of insects totally dependent on the ant. Um, on the right hand side, on Judy Webb's finger, we have a little hoverfly, Microdon devious, uh, which is sometimes called the anthill hoverfly or the downland hoverfly, which only occurs during in ant mounds. And the female, they don't never go very far from the ant mounds. The females lay their eggs in the mound and the larvae which hatch out have an incredibly strange shape. Um, they can be almost circular with a humped back and possibly the ants mistake them for uh, ant larvae and treat them in the same way, but they gorge themselves on the ants, grow bigger and bigger, males and females hatch out, mate in a very short, mating season above the mounds. Uh, there are four species of microdon in Britain. Uh, this is, they, each one specializes in a different species of ant. This beetle has been subject of a lot of research and uh, this, gosh, I've forgotten its name. Um, and it, lives in Lacius flavus mounds on a large scale and it's been found that it it's Claviger testaceous and this is a member of a group of beetles which uh, there are 250 beetles in this group uh, the, the tribe Claviger and um, each one specializes in a different species of ant. And you can see it's got funny knobbly antennae, but some, a series of very complicated experiments uh, done by uh, Amertz in Belgium have shown by putting varnish on the upper and lower lips that the head has, is, has got a fantastic range of glands in it which secrete just the right compounds which resemble those secreted by the larvae. So when a worker ant comes up, this beetle secretes 
chemicals and that causes the ant to regurgitate food to the beetle. Of course, many of you are familiar with green woodpeckers. They produce these sorts of holes in the tops of the mounds, particularly in January, February, March. And um, we don't know, for example, whether they go back to the same holes time and time again, but they're getting at the worker ants, which are hibernating in groups underneath the soil surface in winter. And if you look at their droppings as below, you can see their droppings in winter mainly consist of ants. And there have been one or two papers suggesting that the current distribution of green woodpeckers in Britain is related to that of anthills. So these ants produce considerable ecological services. They maintain bare soil in grasslands. They're almost the only source of bare soil. They're refuge for low growing characteristic plant species um, when the surrounding grassland is undergrazed and they help to recycle nutrients from plants to soil. In fact, the only soil nutrient difference consistent one, apart from perhaps in active anthills, a lack of organic matter, soil carbon um, in is persistent higher exchangeable potassium in the mound soils. And that's probably because of the aphid honeydew having such a high potassium content. But th the main point is that they increase microclimate diversity and hence allow a wider range of organisms to persist, not just those dependent on the ants, but also many others that require a much more variable temperature across the soil surface. So they increase species richness in flora and fauna. Flora. So here are some conclusions. The mounds may last for hundreds of years and cover up to 25% of the grassland surface. I think I think I found the mound that the highest I've seen is 27%. And one point worth researching is that in areas lacking grazing, the mounds may maintain a bank of plant and invertebrate species characteristic of an earlier stage of succession. So if you abandon grazing for a large number of years, say seven or ten, and then reintroduce grazing, there may be on the surface of the mounds some of the species which plant species which previously existed in the grassland able to recolonize the grassland from the mound. That point needs a little more research. And it's probably part of a typical British grassland vegetation. So if a site hasn't got antils, you should wonder why and possibly wonder whether to put them back. Now, one unknown factor from the invertebrate point of view is just how much the ants make other invertebrates scarce in their mounds. If this blue circle represents ant mounds, you see that only 6% of the aphids, 5% of the spree tails, and 3% of the mites are actually inside the anthill soil. Does that mean that the ants banish a large number of other species that, so to speak, get in the way? Or, I mean, what happens when an ant meets an earthworm, for example? We don't know, really. Um, and does this apply to sand wasps, solitary bees, and so on? Are they similarly um, prevented from colonizing the mounds? We don't know. So here is um, here's my email address in case anyone wants to get in touch. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry for the hiatus at the start. <laughs>